Do we think that we will be left alone upon claiming belief and we won't be tested? And he subhanahu wa ta'ala, he answers that question that all of us, we were tested. We were tested in order for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to know who amongst us were truthful in our claims and who amongst us were liars. And my brothers and my sisters, if we do not wake up and realize that these tests are coming our way, whether you like it or not, you are dreaming. You are lost. You do not know why you are here. Whether you like it or not, and if you don't like it, get out of here. Leave, try and leave the heavens and the earth. You are forced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to take this test. There is no running away because He is your creator. Some of us are sitting here stressing out over life, whatever it may be. You're going through hardship right now. Allah Azza wa Jal, He gives you glad tidings. He gives you a beacon of hope. Allah Azza wa Jal, He's your creator. And He knows you better than you know yourself. He knows what you are going through. And this is why Allah Azza wa Jal has says in the Quran that verily with hardship there will be ease. Allah Azza wa Jal is guaranteeing that when you go through a moment or a phase that you feel lost, you feel that you become speechless, you don't know how to describe your situation. Only Allah Azza wa Jal knows your situation. When you go through this phase, Allah always says that there is good to follow. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says in a hadith, that verily if Allah Azza wa Jal loves a person, then he makes him go through trials and tribulation. And the hadith continues, he says, whoever is satisfied for him is contentment. And whoever is angry with Allah Azza wa Jal, then for him is the wrath of Allah Azza wa Jal. With hardship will be ease. And then Allah Azza wa Jal repeats the verse whereby he says, indeed, with hardship will be ease. I've heard a lot of Muslims lately say, I'm so depressed. I was in recently in Arabia and I have a Muslim friend. He was a very active Muslim. And I said, what, what are you doing these days? He said, no, I'm, I just, I, I, I've given up. I've had enough. There's no hope. I grabbed him and I shook him and I said to him, what do you mean there's no hope? We are a religion of hope. We live on hope. Every time you're depressed or you say there's no hope, what you're saying to every African that was brought over in chains and survived the transatlantic crossing and came here and lived in slavery and marched to get their civil rights, you're saying to them that was all a waste of time. If you're depressed, you're dishonoring all those Andalusians who were chased out of what was called paradise at the time. But they made new lives for themselves in Tunisia, in Morocco. You're dishonoring all of those Indians that migrated to Pakistan with the hope of a better life. You're dishonoring the Afghanis that have lived in over 30 years of war. And they're still trying to hold their heads high. We can't do that. There's no room for hope. I'm in it till the last breath. I'm in it till the last breath. This world was never meant to be paradise. God has created a world that is meant to drive you to God. And if you're been, be, being driven to the devil, you've been duped, my friends. Because all of the hardships that you suffer in your life, if you believe in God, you will find those rewards on the day of judgment. Believe in the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you're doing is not to build in this world. If you build for this world, 
What you build will go to naught. We build for the next world, not for this world. No, oh, toughen up. These are days that flip between people. You're gonna be, you're gonna have easy days. You're gonna have hard days. Don't let this overwhelm you and just, you know, beat yourself up. As a matter of fact, the sadness is when you're beating yourself up. A situation beat you up, and now you allowed yourself to get beat up on top of that. Allah says, don't put yourself in that position. You're going to be in the supreme position so long as you're, you're total believers. In other words, these situations, they come and go. But Allah is a constant. You never lost Allah. The one treasure that you don't, you know, once you lose that, you lose everything. And when you have that, nothing else is a serious loss. So long as you have that, you are never, ever, ever going to be in a state where you need to be depressed. I think the best way to relate hardship is to relate it back to the times of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Subhanallah, we find ourselves living through similar situations on the era of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That it's gotten to the extent in some countries that if you say Allah is your Lord, or you go to play Salat al-Fajr at the Masjid, or you grow your beard, you are incarcerated, you are prosecuted, or you are called names. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when the revelations first came down to him, was it easy for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. In fact, it was one of the most difficult times of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Aisha asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was the toughest point of your life? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam indicated to that phase. The year of sorrow, the year of sadness, why was it the year of sadness? Because that was the year Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was boycotted. He and his tribe was boycotted. No one was to deal with them. No one was to marry from them. No one was to speak to them. And in that year, two support systems of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were removed from his life. His uncle, Abu Talib passed away and his wife, his second support system, his second pillar, his wife Khadija radiallahu anha passed away. Rasulullah lost two of the most important people in his life. Quraysh was not accepting the da'wah of Rasulullah. This was another hardship for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he decided to go to where? Ta'if. Rasulullah decided to go to Ta'if to give them da'wah. Maybe the people of Ta'if will respond to the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when he arrived at Ta'if and he gave them the da'wah, what happened? They rebelled against him. They didn't accept his da'wah. They began to stone Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it wasn't the men that stoned Rasulullah, rather it was the children and the slaves to the extent that his feet were covered with blood. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Are you picturing the, the hardship here? Two support systems died, boycotted, stoned from his own people, stoned. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now teaches us a lesson, how to cope with hardship. When Rasulullah was taken onto the outskirts of Ta'if, he sat under a grape tree and his feet وسلم, were overflowing with blood. And Rasulullah made the famous dua. And this dua is the cure for hardship. It is the best way to combat hardship. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka ba'fa quwwati wa qillata hilati wa hawani ala nas. Oh Allah, Ya Rabb. Oh Allah, I say to you, I complain to you my weakness. And my lack of resources and how the people treated me. Subhanallah. He never said, Why Allah are you doing this to me? 
He didn't blame specific individuals. He didn't blame Quraysh. Rather, he blamed himself. My shortcomings. This is the first way to combat a hardship that you're faced with. And then Rasulullah continues with the dua whereby he says, Ya Rabb, to who do you leave my affairs? To a distant person who awaits for me to return so that he can harm me? Or to an enemy? Oh Allah, if you are not upset with me, then I am not concerned. That when we go through tough situations, automatically we think what? That Allah Azza wa Jal is angry with us. But the hadith says, if Allah loves a servant, He puts him through trials and tribulations. And my dear respected brothers and sisters, very important points that we need to remember, that do not be sad with what you're going through. As Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Quran, do not weaken and do not be sad and you are the most high. Allah will grant you his victory. Allah Azza wa Jalla, he says in another verse, and grieve not over them and be not distressed because of what they are plotting against you. You know, there is no need for you to worry and for you to be upset and for you to be sad. Always change the perspective that you're going through, change the hardship that you're going through, the negativity that you're going through, change it into a positive perspective. That this is Allah Azza wa Jal cleansing me, even if it is a sickness. Because if you are going through a sickness, this is Allah Azza wa Jal cleansing you. Your bad deeds turn into good deeds. The most important thing that we have to understand, that when you're going through, the, through, through a time of, of hardship and trials and tribulation, understand that Allah Azza wa Jal is sufficient enough for you. That he who puts his trust in Allah, Allah is sufficient enough for him. Now I'm not sure if I've mentioned this story before here, but wallahi this is a, a story that truly reflects that from hardship comes ease. Especially when you put your faith in Allah Azza wa Jal. My dear respected brothers, there was a person, there was an elderly man. He was a great judge. And this, this judge... He was saying the story of how he became wealthy. What had happened, his name was Qadil Muristan. What had happened with this individual who was walking in the streets of Medina and this person was completely poor. Had no food, no money, nowhere to go. So one day, he was walking in the street to find what? To find a pouch. So he takes his pouch and he goes home. There's no one to claim it. Now he sits down and he opens the pouch to find what? A beautiful pearl necklace. Now we're saying this guy is very poor. He became the wealthiest man. But then what did he say to himself? He said, look, no, this isn't right. This isn't mine. I found this in the street. So what am I going to do? I'm going to walk around in the street and see if somebody is asking for it to give it back to them. So this Qadil Muristan, he walks around in the street. As he's walking in the street, what does he find? He finds an elderly man saying that, has anyone found a pouch that I have lost? So Qadil Muristan, he calls this guy over, this old man, he calls him over. He says, look, this pouch that you're asking of, describe it for me. What makes it so unique? So then the guy starts describing the pouch and the string that's on the pouch. Then he asks him, what's inside of the pouch? He says, a pearl necklace. And he starts describing the pearls that are on it. So Qadil Munistani, he says, you know what? That's, that's sufficient enough. And he gives him the pouch. Now this old man, he says, look, for you giving me back this pouch, I give you a reward. What's this reward? I give you 500 dirhams. Now 500 dirhams is a lot of money, but in comparison to the pearl necklace, it's nothing, it's worthless. So what ends up happening? Qadil Muristan, he says, look, you know what? There's no need to give me this. I didn't really earn it. I didn't really do anything. All I did was I found the pouch and I returned it to its rightful owner. So he doesn't accept the reward. 
He says, Allah Azza wa Jal will, will give me, insha'Allah. Times go past and the times get even tougher. Hardship. He's going through utter hardship. He's still hungry. He's still poor. Just getting by. So he took to the ocean. Now as he's on the ocean, what happens? There is a fault in the ship and the ship sinks. Now you're probably thinking in your mind, this guy has the worst luck, man. He jumps on the ship, the ship sinks. Oof. And he stays alive. And he can't get worse than that. He's going on hardship upon hardship. And subhanAllah, everything on this ship, he was on a merchant ship, everything on the ship sunk. And everyone who was on the vessel died. Allah Azza wa saved this specific person. He held a plank until he made it to an island. Now as he's walking on the island, he realizes in the distance there's a masjid. So he walks to the masjid, and when he goes in, he finds that the masjid is empty. So what does this guy do? He goes to the masjid, he prays his salat, and he grabs a mushaf, and he begins to read. Now this guy, as we said, he's going through hardships here. He's reached the point. He's recited Qur'an, and who hears him? The townspeople, the people of the island. So they come into the masjid amazed, shocked. Who is this person reading? No one can read and write in our, in our island. So they come up to him, they say, who are you? So he tells them his situation. He says, look, I've come and the ship sunk. And... So they ask him, you know how to read Qur'an? He says, yes. They say to him, will you teach us how to read Qur'an? So he agrees. And they began to overwhelm him with gifts and wealth. So what happens? He finds a notebook in the masjid. So he takes and he begins to write. Now here the townspeople are absolutely shocked. The guy's writing. You know how to write also? He says, yes. He says, can you teach us how to write? He says, yes, of course. So he begins to teach them how to write and they start to overwhelm him with gifts and wealth. They want to keep this guy on the island. They don't want him to go back to wherever he came from. So they decided to get this guy married. On the night of his wedding, as he walked in, they realized that this guy wasn't looking at the, at the face of his wife. He wasn't looking at her. He was focusing on her neck. The wife became upset. Why is this guy looking at my neck? He's not looking at my face. It's as if like he's saying that I'm ugly in other words. So the townspeople become very angry with him. You know, what's wrong with you? Why are you you're not looking at her? You're, what, you're trying to say she's ugly, Yanni? So then he says, no, 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 don't misunderstand me. He says, rather I was looking at something that intrigued me that was on her neck. This pearl necklace that was on her neck looks very familiar. He says, that pearl necklace, I found it in Mecca. And I returned it to an old man. The people begin to make takbir. Now Qad al-Muristan at this point, he's, he's shocked. What's going on here? Why are you making takbir for? And they said that this woman that you are marrying, this girl is an orphan. And her father is an elderly man. And what amazed us is this man, he was saying, by Allah, I have never met a young man like that young man that returned my pouch to me, my pearl necklace. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that he unites him with my daughter as her spouse. And Allah has accepted his dua today. Qad al-Muristan, not only did he inherit the pearl necklace, but this man, this elderly man, was a very wealthy man in the, in, on, the, on the island. He inherited everything he had. فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرَى He who puts his trust in Allah, Allah is sufficient enough for him. So my dear respected brothers and sisters, if you're going through a hard time, you're going through a very difficult phase in your life, always understand and have in your mind one verse. And if, you know, if out of all this talk you only understood this part, I'm happy. My dear respected brothers and sisters, remember this. Allah Azza wa Jal, He says in the Qur'an, Allah does not burden a soul more than what it can withstand. So if you're going through a hardship, know that Allah Azza wa Jal knows what you're going through. Because at the end of a dark tunnel, 
there's always light. So just have faith in Allah Azza wa Jal and the most important tool that you have is your dua through your prayers because your salat is, your, is the most important way that you speak to Allah. If you want to speak to Allah, then go into sujood. And if you want Allah to speak to you, then read the Quran. Tell him of your hardships. And I guarantee Allah Azza wa Jal will show you ease after your hardship.